All right. That's what we're going to do in this class. And you will hear from me in a variety of different ways as we go through that. There are really three, we could call them three modes of address, three ways I will address you during this class. Okay? One way that I will address you is sometimes to simply report to you what is well accepted within the field. There are days I will simply report to you certain kinds of historical information, for instance, that's pretty well accepted by scholars within the, the discipline we're discussing that day. So some days I will be simply reporting to you relatively uncontroversial information. Sometimes I will be presenting to you information that reflects a variety of positions on an issue, and I will be trying to represent that variety as accurately and fairly as I can. I may have a point of view myself, but I'll be trying to put out in front of you an array of different positions. But sometimes I will stand up to you and make an argument. There are days I will come in here and I will present to you an argument. Now, first thing we have to recognize is what the term argument means. An argument is more than just shouting at each other. By argument, I mean argument in the classical sense. Right? The presentation of evidence and reasoning to reach a conclusion. An argument in the best sense of the word. There are days I will come into class and I will make an argument. I will be presenting to you my point of view, not necessarily bringing in all the competing points of views, but just giving you my take on something. So those are three different ways of addressing the class. To present to you relatively uncontroversial information. Teachers do that all the time. To present to you an array of different positions on an issue, trying to represent them accurately and fairly. Teachers do that a lot, too. But there are times I will make an argument. When I do that, when I come in and make an argument to you, I will let you know that that's what I'm doing. And your job on days like that is not to sit there, write down everything I say, and assume it is true. Your job is to scrutinize what I'm saying, to ask questions about what kind of assumptions I might be making in this argument to ask questions about how I'm defining terms, to evaluate the quality of the evidence that I'm presenting, and to scrutinize the logic, the reasoning behind it, and then come to your own conclusion about whether my argument is sound or not. The reason I do that is twofold. One is I think, in general, that's a good thing, to hear an argument presented in a coherent, logical fashion. The reason I think it's particularly important is we don't get a lot of that in this culture. This is, uh, to a large degree, a culture not of, our, of argumentation, but a culture of propaganda. Advertising, marketing, public relations. Think about how day in and day out you are bombarded, not with arguments in that classical sense, but with some form of propaganda. And that's not just restricted to the commercial realm, when people are trying to sell you things. It's also true in the political realm as well. Think about how much of contemporary political campaigns are not arguments. They're propaganda. They're advertising, marketing. In 2008, the advertising industry awarded its highest prize to a brand for its success in advertising and marketing. 2008, do you know who won the advertising industry's highest prize? It was brand... Somebody say it. Obama. Yeah, it's okay, you can say it out loud. A presidential candidate won the advertising industry's highest award. That should give you a clue that things are not going so well here in the political arena. We, we're, we're not listening to candidates present arguments. We're listening to advertising, marketing, public relations. We're going to have to think a lot about that. So in a culture in which we're inundated with 
propaganda, honing our skills to make arguments is very important. And so I'll do that throughout the semester and invite you, of course, to challenge those arguments. All right, now, you might be saying to yourself at this point, okay, Jensen, blah, 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 blah. In other words, you might assume the position of my teenage son. Okay, Jensen, blah, 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 blah. Okay, you might be saying to yourself, that's all well and good for you, Jensen, because you obviously have an interest in politics. It's true, I do. So you might be saying, Jensen, you're interested in politics, but I'm not. I'm interested in music, or I'm interested in film, or I'm interested in sports, or I'm interested in a hundred other things, but I'm not a political person. You hear people say that? How many of you have ever said that? Raise your hands. Don't be ashamed. How many of you have ever said, I'm just not political? Okay. All right. So a lot of you raised your hands, and a lot of you didn't raise your hands because you were embarrassed to admit that you've said that. A lot of people have said that. You know what the phrase, I'm not political, translates as? I'm not political means I'm not very bright. <laughs> it means I really don't understand. When you say, and I'm not picking on anybody in particular, uh, much of the culture says this, when you say, I'm just not political, what you're saying is, I do not have even a grade school level capacity to understand the way the world works. You don't want to say that, do you? You don't want to say that, do you? No, you don't want to do that. What, to say, I'm not political, people. Let's, let's think about what that means. Because there is a way in which I sympathize with that comment. If one says, I'm not political, and by that one means, I don't want to get involved in the contemporary process of electing candidates, that I have some sympathy for. Because if you look at the contemporary process by which we elect candidates, it's pretty grim. Right? It's, it's possible when people are saying, I'm not political, that's all they mean. They just mean, listen, contemporary politics, the Republicans and the Democrats, coming together every two or four years in this insane process by which we elect candidates, you know, governed by propaganda and advertising more than by reason debate, <coughs> dominated by increasingly concentrated wealth, if you say to yourself, I'm not political because I don't want to be part of that, that I have sympathy with. But to say you're not political in some deeper sense is to say you have abandoned your role as a member of a community. It means you are not a responsible citizen. I would go even further. It means you are not a responsible person. For a simple reason, there is no escape from politics. Politics in the sense I'm using it now, is more than just how we elect candidates. Politics is the struggle for the distribution of power. That's what politics means. Poli in any society, there is a struggle for the distribution of power. Wherever two or more are gathered, there is politics. Okay? If you put people together, there is power. Think about it even in, at, at the, the smallest level. Think about it within a family, within a group of friends. Let's say that you are going to go meet five of your friends and you're going to go to lunch. There's going to be a decision made, yes? Where are we going to lunch? What time are we going to lunch? Where are we going to meet to go to lunch? There are a whole bunch of decisions that will be made in that group of six people. How are those decisions going to be made? It's not obvious. Are you going to take a vote? Is it going to be a consensus model? Is the person who has the greatest capacity to use physical violence going to make the decision? Right? There, there are lots of options about how you make that decision. All of them are political. They're about how you distribute power within that group. That's a very simple example. You could decide that that group is going to make decisions as democratically as possible, and you're going to perhaps find a way to do that. Or it might be that you re do revert to whoever is the biggest. Often, it reverts to whoever has the most money. Think about it. Let's say there are six people going to lunch, and one of them comes from a very wealthy background and has 
parent's credit card. <laughs> and that person says, well, I'd like to go to this restaurant, and I'm buying. Or we can go somewhere else, in which case I'm not buying. That's political, yes? There's a distribution of power there. In that case, power based on wealth. It can be based on the capacity to use violence. Or it can be based on a reasoned engagement with each other. There's always politics operating everywhere, including at that lowest level, all the way up to the national and the international. There is always politics going on around you. If you say you are not political in this deeper sense, all you are saying is that I abandon my responsibility as a person to the community, and I'm going to cede my power to someone else. When you say, I'm not political, all you're saying is, I'm giving away my power or my potential power to be part of that process. And when you give things away, when you abandon your responsibility, and you don't like the outcome, well, where does that leave you? If you say, I don't want to get involved in politics, and then you don't like the outcome of a political process, what, what standing do you have to complain very much? Again, I am not reducing politics to voting or to participating in elections. There are many other ways people engage politically. And we'll talk about that throughout the semester. So if you're saying, uh, I'm not political, what you're saying essentially is I'm a robot. I, I don't care. Right. Now, hang with me, and then we're going to go to the, the video. I want to bring these two ideas together. The idea that, that every choice we make is political, in some sense, and that there is a deeper sense of politics than just participating in elections. We're going to do that by talking about the man who was honored yesterday with a federal holiday. That man was? Yes, you're right, Mac Brown. Yesterday was Mac Brown Day. All across the nation. Oh, wait. I, I need to let go of Mac Brown and his salary, don't I? I just need to, to, to process, right? Maybe a little therapy. I'll, I'll work on that later. OK. So yesterday was not Mac Brown Day. It was Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday, federal holiday, yes? Now, if you picked up a newspaper or listened to the radio or watched what was going on around town, you know there were lots of occasions and stories that marked Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday, correct? Now, Martin Luther King Jr. is, except in the fringes of U.S. society, considered a hero, correct? Uh, we all know that when Martin Luther King Jr. was alive, he was not considered a hero by everyone. In fact, uh, often a majority of the country felt he was a dangerous threat to the country. The people in power often felt that, subjecting him to incredible police harassment through the National Political Police and the FBI. So uh, Martin Luther King Jr. was not always the beloved figure he is today, but today he's become sort of iconic. He's become an icon for peaceful, nonviolent political struggle and racial reconciliation, yes? And those are things that most people in the country value, at least profess to value. Of course, we know there's still an overtly racist fringe in the United States, maybe even a little bit more than a fringe these days, but there are people who don't accept this. But in general, Martin Luther King Day is a day for people to come together and celebrate peaceful, nonviolent political resistance and racial reconciliation. That's what Martin Luther King Jr. means, correct? That's why we love Martin Luther King Jr., correct? Because he was just a, he was a nice guy who, who, who wanted peace, yes? Peace and harmony. How many of you support peace and harmony? How many of you have deep psychological issues and do not support peace and harmony? How many of you are sociopaths who do not support peace and harmony? How many of you are borderline psychotics we should be afraid of? Oh, good. See, everybody supports peace and harmony. Right? Martin Luther King Jr. Right? He's become this iconic figure, but you know what? That's a political choice to represent Martin Luther King Jr. that way. There were lots of political choices that went into yesterday. 
and how Martin Luther King Jr. was represented. Just let me give you one example. This is the Austin American Statesman. It's your local daily newspaper, yes? I'm sure you're all loyal subscribers to the Austin American Statesman, right? Get it delivered to your doorstep, right? No, you're the, you're the digital generation. It's only old guys like me who still get the paper. So I opened up the paper, the, literally the paper, you know? Here, this paper. What did I do with my... Uh, I actually brought the newspaper in with me to show you that there is a paper. Hey, look at that. You open it up, you're drinking your coffee. Everything's great. A message of peace still resonating in America. Martin Luther King Jr., a message of peace still resonating in America. If you look at the speeches and writings that are excerpted on this page in the Austin American Statesman, you'll find that the picture of Martin Luther King Jr. is that picture of peaceful, nonviolent political struggle and racial reconciliation. But what about the other aspects of Martin Luther King Jr.'s politics and philosophy? Were they represented? You might be saying, well, what, what do you mean, Martin Luther King Jr.? Peaceful nonviolent, political resistance, and racial reconciliation. What else is there? Well, there's actually quite a lot else there in the life, the career, the writings of Martin Luther King Jr. Martin Luther King Jr., for instance, was a increasingly radical critic of American capitalism. American capitalism. Martin Luther King Jr., especially near the end of his life, spoke out strongly against what he called economic exploitation in the American economic system. At the end of his life, right before he, ki he was killed, Martin Luther King Jr. was actually helping to, argue, helping to organize a poor people's campaign. Not just a campaign against racial segregation and racism, but a multiracial, multiethnic, poor people's campaign to put on the political agenda what he called economic exploitation in the American system. Also right before his death, in the previous year, Martin Luther King came out with several very strong speeches criticizing the American invasion of Southeast Asia, what we call the Vietnam War. He was a strong anti-war voice. In fact, he went beyond simply criticizing the American war in Vietnam to criticize American foreign policy in general. He talked about the United States being on the wrong side of a world revolution. Martin Luther King Jr. said, there's a revolution out there, people. This is the late 1960s. Decolonization of the third world, liberation movements both within the United States and elsewhere. This is the late 1960s, people. Things were on fire in the late 1960s. I know most of you were not born then. But things were hopping. There was a world revolution going on. Didn't work out the way some people had hoped, but there were very, very important issues at stake. And Martin Luther King Jr., in a very famous speech in 1967, said, the United States is on the wrong side of a world revolution. He said, that the United States, in the pursuit of profits by exploiting people at home and abroad, was on the wrong side of the revolution. He talked not just about racism, he talked about what he called the triplets of misery, economic exploitation, racism, and militarism, speaking out not just against that particular war, but against U.S. foreign policy and violence across the board. In 1967, Martin Luther King Jr. said that he could not remain silent about the war because the United States, his government, was the greatest purveyor of violence in the world. Martin Luther King Jr. labeled the United States, 
as the greatest purveyor of violence in the world. He called U.S. policy unjust over and over again. Now, if you were listening to the radio or watching television or reading the news yesterday, my guess is that you did not read excerpts of Martin Luther King Jr.'s speeches condemning economic exploitation and capitalism or the Vietnam War and the greater system of U.S. imperialism. My guess is you didn't see that. And you didn't see that because the editors and news directors in America chose not to make that part of the Martin Luther King Jr. story. They chose to highlight peaceful nonviolent struggle and racial reconciliation. Okay. Now, let me ask you a couple of questions. They're not trick questions, they're easy. The, the last 10 minutes, when I describe to you the other political perspectives of Martin Luther King Jr., was there a politics to that? Do you think it reflected my political understanding of the world and of King? Did I bring some of my politics into the room just now? Huh? If I had chose not to speak about this, if I had taken the position of the editors and news directors and left that part of King out of the story of Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday, would that have been bringing some politics into the discussion? Both of them are political choices. Okay. Now, which one is correct? Well, in some sense, you know, these are matters of interpretation, how to understand history, and they don't lend themselves to correct or incorrect evaluations. But which one was correct? Well, if we were going to evaluate that, we'd have to study King, we'd have to study the period in which King lived, we'd have to study the underlying philosophy King brought to, to bear on that period, we'd have to ask, how do King's ideas from the 50s and 60s apply to political and economic conditions today, we'd have to engage. And we'd have to listen to people defend one or the other of those positions. And that would be the question, not is one political and one not. Both are political. How well can you defend your decision in, presenta in presenting that material? That's all you have to do. And I think I can make a pretty good case for why the the part of Martin Luther King's philosophy and politics that was critical of the concentration of wealth and exploitation in the economy and the use of violence by the United States around the world. I can make a pretty good case, I think, for why that's central to who King was, to the evolution of King. I can chart the career of Martin Luther King Jr., starting with his early work in the civil rights movement, focused simply on ending American apartheid focused on ending Jim Crow segregation, especially in the American South, winning for not only African Americans, but all non-white people, basic rights of citizenship. And we can chart how, as he engaged in that activity, his own philosophy shifted, his own ideas changed. We can talk about how his famous speeches against the Vietnam War caused great controversy within the civil rights movement, some of his colleagues thought it was politically unwise to start speaking out that way. Others endorsed it. We can talk about his interaction with Malcolm X, other parts of the black nationalist movement, how that changed the way he saw the world. We can go through that, and we can see an evolution of the philosophy of Martin Luther King Jr. And I would make the argument that that's a richer, fuller, and more useful way to deal with the life and legacy of Martin Luther King Jr. than simply freezing him in 1963, on the steps of the Capitol, where he had a, a dream. It's a great speech. If you've never listened to the I Have a Dream speech, you should. It's an amazing piece of rhetoric. The story behind it is amazing, how King had a text, and he was delivering that text, and as he was speaking, there were people behind him encouraging him to go beyond the text, pushing him. Farther, Martin, go for it. And that whole last segment, I Have a Dream, was improvised. The fascinating story about that speech. 
But that's not the only great speech Martin Luther King Jr. ever gave. He gave other important speeches throughout his life up until the day he died. And if you've never looked at the video, we don't have time to look at it today, of the speech in Memphis the night before he died, it will give you chills. In other words, Martin Luther King Jr. is not a statue. He was a living, breathing person. And you have to understand the evolution of that person to understand him. My argument, and I'm defending the position I'm taking, is that it is wrong to freeze him in time just because that's safe, because everybody will agree that nonviolent, peaceful political change and racial reconciliation are good. I'm not arguing against nonviolent political change, and I'm not arguing against racial reconciliation. I'm arguing against freezing Martin Luther King Jr. in that position. That's point number one, the politics of that. Okay. Political to freeze him, political to argue that we should see a deeper, richer king. Now, let's use this example to, to emphasize one more thing. Remember I said that politics is more than elections. This is a, an important question. Name the political offices that Martin Luther King Jr. ran for in his lifetime. The elected political positions Martin Luther King sought. Martin Luther King Jr. ran for What? Doesn't anybody know? Are you your college students, you don't know? It's a trick question. Don't, everybody's looking, oh my god, I don't know what did he run for. I forgot, please don't, don't look at me, don't look at me. He didn't run for anything. Martin Luther King Jr. never ran for office. Right? Martin Luther King Jr. never endorsed political candidates. The Southern Christian Leadership Conference was, not, was a deeply political organization, yes? trying to change the distribution of power in the United States, particularly in the American South. That was political. Would anybody argue Martin Luther King Jr. wasn't political? Of course he was political. But he never ran for office, and he never supported candidates directly. He never used his position to get people elected. He did work with elected officials. He did have meetings with politicians, including the President of the United States. But Martin Luther, nobody would say Martin Luther King Jr. wasn't political, but Martin Luther King Jr. did not focus his political energies on the electoral system. He did not focus his energies on running for office himself or getting people elected. He focused, as have many of the most important social movements in history, he focused on building power at the grassroots level, building power among people to influence the direction of the society, not by electing candidates, but by amassing grassroots power at such a level that politicians, elected officials, would have to pay attention. So what I'm trying to hammer on today is, number one, you are political whether you like it or not, and so am I. And the question isn't how do we try to evade that, the question is how do we embrace it? because that is what it means to be a person, is to recognize that. At least it's one aspect of being a person, I think. And second, politics is more than simply elections. Politics is a much deeper, richer, and potentially truly revolutionary process than simply elections. 